Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This will be the start of a new story called Return of Nightmares Past. All credit to the author, their information can be found in the description below, as well as a link to the story if you would like to read along. This will be chapter 1 to 2. Also, don't forget to smash that like button and comment to help with the algorithm. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the story. Two young children played together in a large backyard. Both had hair as white as most of their families. The girl's hair was in a long braided ponytail, and she wore a rather fancy white and light blue dress. The boy had short, spiky hair and wore some fancy clothes as well, in white slacks and a light blue shirt. Both played a game with an older white-haired girl who wore a white bony mask with the face of a wolf. I'm gonna eat you. No. The little girl laughed with a high-pitched scream. I got you, the young boy declared as he stood in front of the girl protectively with a cocky smirk. You won't wolf me or my sister down. Laughter soon followed from a woman who looked like all her children but had sadness in her eyes. Naruto, I'm going to get you for this. A female voice screamed out in rage. The same boy, now older at 10, chuckled as he observed a massive party going on in the large living room his family owned. He was in a three-piece white and dark blue suit that his father demanded he wear, even when the man was not around. He still had a small smirk on his face, only this time because he played a small prank on their older sister, the classic pie to the face, while his twin distracted her during his own escape down the long hallways of their mansion. He wouldn't admit it, but his older sister was scary when mad. At least his little brother thought the whole thing was funny. Still, he found he really liked the name Naruto that he tricked his sisters and mother into calling him. He was Eri Shni, but something deep within told him that his real name had been this strange foreign name that he instantly took a liking to. Deciding to waste time in order for her to cool down, he casually walked down the halls and observed some of their pictures. One of his favorites was one that he was told was of his grandfather. That man was nothing like the man he called father, who was just a shrewd businessman compared to the huntsman adventurer. The older man was his hero and loved his family when he was alive. He was brought out of his thoughts when he heard yelling. Walking over to a nearby door that he remembered was his father's den. There was a crack in the door and so he peeked in. Why aren't you at the party? His mother roared at their father, who looked at her dismissively. Come to think of it, he looked at all of them like that. Like they were beneath his time. It's our twin's tenth birthday. You have been hiding yourself away more and more from us. Do we matter? The man, his father, had an agitated look on his mustached face. Fine woman, no. None of you matter but the Schnee name that I am working to raise higher into the world. He finally replied callously. What? His mother whispered in near-silent horror, and it sparked something in the youth. Anger. He had already figured his father was a slime ball, only looking for power, but he kept silent, not wanting to hurt his family with that info. Now that man just spits it out, and he could see he was right to keep that info locked away. It hurt his mother. Willow, you were born into this world of riches. I wasn't. I learned long ago that reputation and money are all that matters in this world. I had to claw, cheat, and murder to get where I was when I met you. He roared out with a manic look in his eyes. I didn't want what I perceived as good to stop, so I convinced your father to let me marry you, and you were such an obedient little thing too. I gifted you with my heirs as thanks. Still, it wasn't enough, so I further convinced that old fool to give me the company and look where I have taken it. The Schnee Dust Company is one of the most powerful companies in all of Remnant. He scoffed as he gave her an annoyed look before grabbing her arm painfully. You were just a stepping stone to my greatness and now that you know, you will continue to act your part. The reputation of the Schnee family is mine now, so you, nor Winter, Ares Weiss, or Whitley will cause problems for me. Do you understand? Jacques, you're hurting me. Answer me, woman. R-A-G-H. Naruto screamed in rage as his semblance activated, the telltale glyph appearing and ramming into his father's solar plexus with the force of a rampaging Borbatusk, breaking his hold on his mother and laying him out flat on the ground. Seeing the man on the ground, Naruto's cold blue eyes pierced the man's, who seemed frozen at the sudden outburst and the pain he felt. Do. Not. Touch. Her. Naruto sat in his father's desk chair with a crap-eating grin. The only reason he was in here was the man was supposed to be on some business venture, engaged in something morally ambiguous, no doubt. But the 13-year-old didn't care despite Weiss' warning. As long as the man did not touch his mother or sisters, he was calm and didn't care much about what happened to him. Of course, Winter was already in the Atlas military, away from them so he didn't have to worry much about her. Then there was Whitley, or as he liked to call him, 
Jacques Minimi, the brat idolized their father, not caring what was the truth or not. Anyway, Naruto was going over the extensive notes and calculations he had sprawled across a good portion of the desk, with an old tome and a map at the center. The tome itself was a text written by an ancestor, and had been stored in that archive his grandfather seemed to be the only one aware of, at least until Naruto spotted him exiting it one night. The first entry of the text greatly intrigued Naruto, and it had been a growing pet project over the past couple of months in his spare time. The text started with a rather dark tale of four powerful warriors that seemed to have a connection to the tale of the seasons. At the time, these were referred to as the Grim Nightmares, and extremely dangerous. So much so, that the ancestors spent the rest of their days tracking down every scrap of information with the intended goal to destroy whatever remained, especially some kind of relics that defined each of these four. The reason Naruto was smiling was that he had finished correlating everything, and with a flourish marked on the map a possible location to one of these relics. But Naruto's feeling of victory was short-lived, for Jacques soon burst into the study, raving in rage about the White Fang again. He was about to vent onto Naruto when the youth came into his sights, but stopped upon seeing the tome and the marked map. Everything became a blood-red haze for Naruto after that. Oh sure, he had found one of the nightmare's resting places, but that is where everything went wrong. There was panic, chaos, and people scrambling about. One such expedition member, in their panic, knocked him over and into a container, the one with the assumed relic belonging to the nightmare inside it. Upon making contact, he was nothing more than a raging beast as the relic's power consumed his mind. So lost was he, the expedition his father hired was wiped out. Naruto could only suffer in excruciating agony as time slowly became irrelevant. A presence he didn't have the luxury to notice would rise, and he would be slammed with memories. Memories that were not his, but showed suffering not so different. This continued until the clarity came and the agony ended. With the clarity, he soon found out the source that gave it to him, and in gratitude, gave it a name. One that flitted in and out of his mind, but never had something to attach it to. And that name was Karama. Soon after, Karama advised him to go on a little journey to find some people and to train. And since Naruto was already out of reach of his father, he would play life his way. Find the people, and really be Naruto. Not Eri Shni, the misfit son of Jacques Shni. He soon found he was already on the continent of Anima, which already helped with his task. Near the capital of the kingdom, Mistal, Naruto soon felt a pull and followed it. The pull led him to a hidden little speakeasy for the underage that wanted to try their tastes of alcohol. At the bar sat one of Naruto's task objectives. Because, Naruto said, voice barely above a whisper, to that objective, like me you'll wind up a free man. After a hard sell in theatric song and dance form, after temporarily relocating to a stage, Naruto was soon back on the road again, but this time not alone. Now it was the Sanus continent's turn. Here Naruto and his companion of over a month felt like they were dying from the hellish heat the sun and sand produced. Thankfully their suffering was worth it, when in a blink and miss moment, the next objective descended upon them. When all was said and done, Naruto and now two companions left the scorching desert. The last objective was surprisingly found in the Kingdom of Vale and near the destroyed settlement of Lower Karen. Along the way, the trio encountered powerful and strange Grimm, but each battle only served to make them and their eventual new addition stronger and stronger. For years later, Ring Ring Naruto looked at his scroll and upon seeing the ID, picked up with a casual tone, Hello Mother Dearest, how are things at home? Tense as always, dear but thank you for keeping in touch with me at least. You are driving winter up the walls with your cat and mouse game, and Weiss is torn between being worried for your health and wanting to kill you with her bare hands because she feels that deep down, you aren't as dead as your father proclaims. Whitley is Whitley. Willow sighed heavily. What about you, Mom? If you weren't on my side and always looking out for us, for me, like you always seem to do, then I feel I'd be a different woman. Willow seemed to pause for a moment and then said, but this isn't about me. It is about Weiss. She left. What do you mean she left? Naruto asked, concern and worry about to rise into panic territory. She finally had enough of your father and left like Winter did, but she did not join the Atlas military. She's heading to Beacon. Birds of a feather, Naruto said lightly as calm replaced the near panic. I'm on my way there myself. Naruto awoke from his slumber with a jolt because of two reasons. The loud PS system saying the bullhead he was riding had arrived at Beacon and the other because some blonde teen in white armor tripped over his outstretched leg in his rush to go puke somewhere while a couple of girls screamed about how gross it was that they got some of their shoes. 
It was an amusing way to wake up from memory lane. Once the ship landed and they were able to get off, the blonde kid rushed out first to go and find a trash can to vomit in. Naruto had to admit, motion sickness was pretty damn rough and truthfully, he could use that in a prank if the boy ever pissed him off. Something told him he wouldn't have to do that. But man, not even a minute here and he was already plotting and not thinking of friendship. Ugh, Kurama really got to him sometimes. What he needed to do was go and find his sister, and funnily enough, he didn't have to look very long because one of the girls that got vomit on their shoes fell right onto her stuff. Crossing his arms with a smirk, he decided to wait this one out while nodding to some faces he became familiar with in the past four years. Some keeping to themselves, one in particular attracting way too much attention from the opposite sex. Go figure. The reason for the small distance was that their curse was old, and they felt that if people knew about their connection too quickly, things could go south. That and the fact that Salem's friends were always watching for a time to strike. What are you doing? The somewhat snarky voice of his twin called out to the girl that fell on her stuff. The poor kid got in early and has to deal with someone's temper this early in the morning. Naruto had to admit, though, his sister looked cute in what she picked out for combat attire. Weiss wore a thigh-length strapless dress with a faint color gradation from white to pale blue at the hem. A small piece of black lace sits in the front of her neckline, and the hem of the dress was scalloped and stitched to resemble snowflakes, with layers of white tulle under the skirt. Over this, she wore a bell-sleeved bolero with the same color gradation as her dress from shoulder to wrist, lined in red and with a ruffled collar. On the back of the bolero is the schnee crest. She also had on a small apple pendant on a silver chain and thin, rectangular silver earrings. Her boots are white, wedged-heeled, and higher at the back than the front. They have a small silver decoration across the top of the foot and are lined in red. A thin white sash is tied around her waist with a pouch attached to the back. Naruto also noticed the small addition to her face, a scar above and below her right eye, that he was going to have to ask about. Sorry, the girl in primarily red and black explained as she tried to get back up from having fallen on suitcases, and then the rest fell on her. He caught that her eyes were silver in her panic, and it seemed to make Kurama nervous. Odd. In addition to her unique eyes, she had neck-length black hair with red tips. Her red and black clothes were a black long-sleeved blouse with a high collar and red trim on the silver, over which was a black waist cincher with red lacing up the front and matching skirt with red lining. She also had a pair of thick black stockings and black combat boots with red laces, red trims around the top, and red soles. It was topped by a red hooded cloak fastened to her shoulders by cross-shaped pins. Finally, she had a silver rose that looked to be on fire on her belt. Neat. Clearly, both went for some speed in their battle skirts. Saw thee? Do you have any idea of the damage you could have caused? His sister argued, but he could see that in a way, she was looking out for red. No doubt she had some volatile dust in those suitcases. Turns out, he was right when she opened one. This is dust, mined and purified from the Schnee quarry. Uh, what are you, brain dead? Dust. Fire. Water. Lightning. Energy. Are you even listening to me? Weiss went on, but with every word, she shook the vials of dust, making them trickle down to the other girl's nose. Naruto shook his head at that. No doubt Weiss wasn't even paying any attention to that. No doubt in her anger and worries, and maybe annoyance in having to deal with someone younger than her. Like Whitley, that she was the one handling the dust haphazardly. Is any of this sinking in? What do you have to say for yourself? A chew. Naruto had to bite his fist to keep from laughing too hard at the dust explosion that surrounded his sister. In a way, that was her own doing. He did manage to notice a friend give the two girls a look before going about their business and into the school. Unbelievable. That was the exact thing I was talking about. Weiss started on her tirade at the girl as she shuffled out of the dust cloud. I am really sorry. Red tried to apologize sincerely and Naruto felt that he had to step in while smiling kindly at a quiet raven-haired girl walking up to them as well. She didn't react much as she stared at the other two girls with a book in one hand and a vial of dust in the other. No doubt that had been blasted away in the explosion. Ugh. You complete dolt. What are, both girls heard a male chuckle, and then a familiar voice with a teasing edge, that the one dressed in white hadn't heard in four years, I'm a little hurt Weiss. Both girls whipped around to the source. I mean having a blast without me. We're supposed to be family. Weiss's eyes widened as she saw the person, Ares, she said, her voice cracking with emotion, before rushing over and embracing him. It's really you, Ares? Yes, it is, my dear sister, Naruto said softly to Weiss, wrapping his arms around her in a comforting fashion. I'm back? While a cute scene to red, 
She had to admit this Aries guy looked rather imposing in the attire he picked out for himself. He wore a red armored shirt with an open, long-sleeved mid-waisted gray-blue jacket, complete with a white puffed collar and red accents, along with matching pants. He also had on a black choker and had two small wing-like attachments that acted as small capes that flowed off his back in the wind fucked from his jacket. They were black on the inside and red on the outside. His black shoes were made for combat, but looked like fancy dress shoes with red trim outlining the bottom. He also wore armored black gloves with the fingers all being red. Finally, he wore what looked like a sword hilt with no blade, with an integrated ultra-compact dust cylinder. The lack of a blade is the part that made her curiosity rise. So, the rumors were true. However, that curiosity would have to wait as another person decided to join in their conversation. She was a fair-skinned young woman with wavy black hair and amber eyes. She had on a black, buttoned vest with coattails and a single silver button on the front. Underneath this was a white, sleeveless, high-necked, crop undershirt and white shorts with a zipper on the front of each leg, emblazoned with the YKK logo of the real-life Japanese zipper manufacturer. She wore a pair of black low-heeled boots and full stockings with a color gradation of black to purple at her ankles. Her emblem is visible on the outside of both thighs, just below her shorts in white. On her left arm is a black detached sleeve with a silver cuff around her bicep and black. Ribbons are wrapped around both forearms. A small, loose, black scarf is wrapped around her neck, and a gray magnetic backpack is strapped to her back, hidden by her hair. Finally, a black ribbon was tied with a large bow on the top of her head, with her cat ears hidden inside the loops and she wore purple eyeshadow in cat's eye style. Naruto turned his attention to the girl. He wondered what rumor she meant. In a rather cool tone, she eyed both Naruto and Weiss passively, but there was a small hint of annoyance. Eri Shni is alive. Sorry, who? Red asked, relieved that most of the negative attention was not directed at her anymore. However, she was curious about the person who inadvertently saved her from a verbal beat down in the form of an angry girl in white. The Ravenette gave her a passing glance before returning to the twins, Ares and Weiss Schnee, heirs to the Schnee Dust Company, one of the largest producers of energy propellant in the world. Finally, some recognition? Weiss replied with a smile, but noticed that Naruto wasn't smiling. That was right, he wasn't as proud of their last name as others are. Something tells me that you don't approve though, Naruto replied flatly. How can I when it is also infamous for its controversial labor forces and questionable business partners? The Ravenette continued with a glare, but there was confusion in her eyes when she saw he looked apologetic about that. Before Weiss could get offended by this, Naruto smiled gently and placed a silencing hand on her shoulder. While I can't deny anything, but all of that is on dear old dad's head, I am not him. In fact, when I was home, I often made his life harder. At that, Weiss had a nostalgic smile on her face as she remembered those days. So the world knows me as Eri Schnee, but please, just call me Naruto. He held out a hand to shake hers with a genuine smile on his face. For her part, the Ravenette was conflicted now. Here she was, slamming the Schnee twins with the truth, and before her was the wayward son of the two, not acting like a spoiled rich kid. While rumors of his pranks did reach some ears, like those in the White Fang when they were peaceful, no one was really expecting to see a good side to the boy, especially after the incident where most of the world thought he died. Of course, the rumor mill was always spinning and often said he was alive, screwing with his father's head. People like that rumor more. Deciding to think it over, she put the vial of dust in his hand. Blake. She intoned before leaving. He was kind enough to give his, so she could be just as civil, right? Naruto sighed as she walked away. He figured he'd have an uphill battle with people once he fully came out of hiding. Seems he would just have to prove himself. That was fine. Turning to Red, he offered his hand as well, after passing the vial over to Weiss that is. I know my sister means well, but she can come off a bit strong sometimes. Give her a chance for me. I can do that. I am Ruby, by the way, Red replied shyly, but with more pep in her voice as she continued. Enough about that. Weiss finally exploded on him and started dragging him into Beacon. You need to tell me what you are doing here and why you choose to come out of hiding now. Well, for one, I knew you'd be here. So I wanted to make sure you were okay and spend some time with you out of our father's sight and reach, Naruto replied as he waved a silent goodbye to Ruby. She looked like a good kid, so he wasn't as worried about her, especially when the blonde from earlier was going over to greet her. They'd be fine, right? How did you know I'd be here? Weiss asked curiously. She was happy to see him, of course. But he never made it back home, and so he shouldn't have known that she came to Beacon, right? You can thank mom for that, 
Naruto replied with a lopsided smile. Mom knew you were alive and didn't tell us? Weiss nearly screamed in shock. Winter has been using Atlas resources to find you. Naruto scratched his cheek with a slight smirk. All part to the game to stay out of father's sight. Plus, it was fun leaving traces for her to figure things out. Pretty sure we'll see her at the vital festival this year. Weiss stopped them and embraced him once more. Actual tears were welling up. I missed you. I really thought you died. Especially when our connection cut out for a while and then came back weak. What happened? Naruto sighed as he comforted the girl. I can't tell you a whole lot. Mostly because my memory is a bit fuzzy of the whole thing on account that I woke up somewhere else entirely, but thankfully it was near Mistral. You can't remember? Naruto. Winter told me they found a massacre. We feared the worst, or that you were held captive somewhere. Plus, there were reports of a massive horde of Grimm that hunters and huntresses had to wipe out before actually being able to go there and find out what happened. You, you are the only survivor. She cried as she pounded his chest. I know, Naruto replied with a sigh, and a broken look in his eyes that Weiss felt was entirely out of place on his usually happy face. She found she really hated it. I get flashes but because of that, I am not really eager to know the truth. And father got his prize. What do you mean? Weiss said after wiping her eyes and leading them in the building. Me gone! Naruto laughed a little at that while Weiss had a hurt look. Again, I really should have kept in contact with everyone, not just mom. I am sorry. You're forgiven, but you are spending some quality time here with me. I want all that lost time paid back. Also, what did you actually find? Weiss replied. She figured he stayed away from their father. Winter did it, Naruto did it, and now she is doing it. Naruto held up the hilt of a sword with a cheeky grin. The last remnant of a powerful warrior. So, I reforged it into something I can use. It was best not to tell her the whole truth yet. He honestly feared what she would think of it. Of him. Father sent you out to some ruin. Only to find a broken weapon? Weiss replied flatly. I bet this news would really rattle him. I love it. Oh? Am I rubbing off on you already? Naruto asked with a sly smirk. May Abe. Weiss replied in kint. But I am serious about spending as much time as we can. Winter will for sure murder you for real at the vital festival. Good one. Naruto laughed. It seemed his sister hadn't lost her sly edge while he was away. Wait, real death? You sure about that? Weiss just started walking away with a giggle. Weiss? Oh look, Red's here already, Naruto said as they walked into the auditorium where orientation was being held for all the first years. That's right, Weiss said quietly before her eyes took on a certain shine. I still haven't yelled at her properly. You're kidding, Naruto said flatly as he watched his sister go after Ruby. Apparently not. Observing Ruby with a blonde girl, he had to admit she was pretty cute, before his attention was brought to a familiar voice. Ah oh, great. Where am I supposed to find another nice quirky girl to talk to? The blonde boy complained. Naruto shrugged and walked over to him, while noticing a certain redhead eyeing the blonde. Ah, don't worry about that Chuck, Naruto said as he stood next to the blonde with a smirk when the boy jumped a bit at his sudden appearance. That was telling. Keep being yourself, and some girl should sweep you off your feet. Huh? Oh, you're the guy that slept the whole time on the bullhead. The blonde replied with wide eyes before they clouded in confusion. My name's John. Jonark. Not Chuck. John was as tall as the Schnee, with messy blonde hair and dark blue eyes. Naruto could just tell the boy didn't have much experience fighting. His connection to all things war gave a view in that. John wore a black short-sleeved hoodie with detached reddish-orange sleeves and a dark brown image of the bunny rabbit pumpkin peat trimmed in white with cute black round eyes. Whatever was on the hoodie though was obscured by a white diamond-shaped chest plate cut off above his lower abdomen, and placed over his shoulders are a pair of white spalders with re-embraces set under them. Below, he wears blue jeans with a white patch placed on the left knee and black sneakers which have left and right written in black on the respective shoe soles. His weapon seemed to be a sword he strapped to his left hip. Clearly, the boy wanted to be here for a reason despite his lack of skill, but maybe Naruto and a few others could subtly help him. After all, it was with teamwork that battles were won. Oh, lighten up, Chuck, Naruto replied with a cheesy grin at his own joke that took a minute for John to get, but there were a few that got a good laugh out of it. It was just a fun nickname, better than Vomit Boy. Anyway, nice to meet you, John. Call me Naruto. Huh, that is a bit more tasteful. John chuckle de nervously. So you don't mind talking to me? Nah, Naruto replied with a relaxed stance. I could honestly use more friends and you seem to stand out. I am sure we can help each other in the long run. 
Oh, thank God, John replied. Growing up with seven sisters made it a bit hard to get actual friends that weren't into them. I am just glad you talked to me, even though my mom says I need to have more confidence when I speak to people. She sounds like a smart woman. I'd listen to her. Naruto replied honestly. Sure, he was a mama's boy, but with a father like Shock, could you blame him? Then he heard his sister blowing it at making friends with the ruby girl, but she did mention John as a cute boy they could talk about, getting said blonde's attention. A smirk crossed his lips, something if Weiss saw, she'd know there'd be trouble. Speaking of confidence, you could try catching my sister's attention. You know you're right. It would also be nice to have a girlfriend, so I just might. Confidence is key. John replied psyching himself up for all the flirting he was going to do later. He, of course, didn't know of the flame that entered the white-haired boy's eye. He might be doing this as a subtle prank on Weiss. And to further mellow her out. But if John ever broke her heart, there would be hell to pay. John also questioned the sudden chill up his spine. I'll keep this brief. A voice rang out, catching everyone's attention. It turned out to be Professor Ashbin, the headmaster of Beacon on stage, with another teacher next to him. Ashbin was a middle-aged man with tousled silver hair and thin brown eyes. He has a light complexion and sharp facial features. He wore shaded glass spectacles and a small, purple, cross-shaped pin on the cowl around his neck. His outfit mainly consists of an unzipped black suit over a dark green, button vest, and green shirt. He also wore black trouser shoes and long, dark green pants. You have traveled here today in search of knowledge, to hone your craft and acquire new skills. And when you are finished, you plan to dedicate your life to the protection of the people. Naruto eyed the man on stage with a sense of unease, like he had met the man before somehow and was wary of his power. Karama also warned him to not reveal too much too soon to the man. That was fine with him. There was something odd about him. But I look amongst you and all I see is wasted energy, in need of purpose, direction. You assume knowledge will free you of this, but your time at this school will prove that knowledge can only carry you so far. It is up to you to take the first step. Naruto had to admit that was a good speech, but he saw one of his friends scoff at his words. He knew that to her. Knowledge meant a lot. To her, knowledge and power kept you safe. Seems that while here, they would gain both, even if their past lives already gave them much. Doesn't hurt to get more. Ashbin quickly walked off the stage after that. He felt his part was done. So the blonde teacher next to him took center stage and continued for him. Naruto thought someone say her name was Glinda Goodwitch. Interesting. She didn't look like much of a witch. Instead, more like a strict disciplinarian. He found that funny. Glinda seemed to be middle-aged too, but her age was more graceful as there were very little grays in her blonde hair, which was tied in a bun in the back with a curl hanging down the right side of her face. She had green eyes that were covered by thin, ovular glasses and teal earrings dangling on her ears. She had on a white long-sleeved, pleated top that had a wide keyhole neckline and gauntlet cuffs that flare in pleats at the wrist. Her lower body was covered by a black, high-waisted pencil skirt with bronze buttons and black, fading into brown stockings. On her feet, she had black boots with bronze heels and a cape that was purple inside and black on the outside. The cut of the cape was stylized to end in flames and arrows, with a row of diamond-shaped bronze beads on the back. Above this line of beads appeared an emblem of a tiara that is her personal symbol. Huh. A lot of people had those personal symbols, his family included. Maybe, he could alter his later. You will all gather in the ballroom tonight, tomorrow. Your initiation begins. Be ready, you're dismissed. John, please tell me you are joking, Naruto pleaded as he looked upon John's nightwear. Seriously? A onesie? Okay, maybe he wouldn't bother to prank the blonde in the future because he was pranking himself. Why John didn't just wear a t-shirt and shorts to bed as most teens confused him. After all, his red shirt and black shorts were really comfortable. What? John asked as he looked himself over in his blue onesie with feet. These are my usual PJs, and they're quite comfortable. John, look around, Naruto said as he gestured to the people all around them. They have different PJs themselves, but none have something to be worn by kids. I am only saying this to save whatever love life you wish to have. Thank you, Naruto, but I think it will be fine for one night. I have other PJs, but I thought this would be fine, John replied with a shrug but even he saw that quite a few girls were laughing at him and he wondered if he already ruined his chances with them. Despite his confidence, he would need to work on himself as well. That is good to know at least. Naruto shook his head before smiling when he saw one of his friends. The other two were probably off doing their own thing. That one of them was in the group of boys. Shaking his head, 
He led John over to the friend he spotted earlier today and honestly, his best friend. Hey, Sid, the white-haired Schnee called out. Caught in the middle of a silent conversation with who he knew as Blake, said boy turned his attention to him while Blake just stared. The boy was pretty lean and had tan skin like those of South America, showing he also got out a lot. Short black hair that was slicked back. His usual attire was taken off in place of a mint green shirt and black shorts. Oddly enough, he wore a yellow belt with black spots. Naruto, good to see you are making friends, but I doubt he would survive even the gates of Miklin. I didn't know you read the Aztec Hero as well. Seems your interest in my book is not just the person reading it, Blake replied with a curious tone in her voice. Honestly, she thought he had been flirting with her or something. The stories of others often interest me, Sid replied. That is why I was an actor back in Mistral. I got to experience the views and beliefs of others through them. However, I was in a bit of a rut until Naruto showed one day and strong-armed me into training to become a huntsman. Sid then turned to Naruto and John with a somewhat stoic expression. But I see why you introduced him to me. He will need all the friends he can get. I am Sid Evergreen, by the way. Come on, guys. You make it sound like I'm socially awkward, John joked. You are, Naruto replied bluntly as he pointed at the boys' attire in a room full of teenagers. That was humiliation waiting to happen. But as your friends, it is our job to make sure you get on the right track. And as Naruto's friend, I will do my best to help him not corrupt you, Sid replied with a small smirk directed at Naruto, who squawked in disbelief. Turning back to Blake, who seemed to take interest in the both of them for a moment, he said, It was nice getting to know you, Blake. I hope you will let me borrow that book when you are done. He paused for a moment, contemplating what he should do about her hiding her faunus nature. She probably had her reasons. Or if you even want to talk, just make sure the cat doesn't have your tongue. He winked at her and left with the other two boys. Blake blinked oolishly at that until she saw Sid's belt twitch. That threw her for a loop. Ari Schnee was best friends with a faunus? Huh. Maybe he really wasn't like his father after all. The rest of the night went pretty well. The three boys got along pretty well despite their distaste for John's nightwear. Naruto did keep an eye on his sister, who slept with the other girls on the other side of the ballroom. Blake had been doing fine until Ruby and her blonde friend bothered her with something. Then his sister got into it with Ruby again. He would have to do something about that. He just didn't know what. As the commotion died down, he saw the blonde girl glance at him and wink. First thing in the morning, locker room. Curious thing, this, chakra, you strangely remember, is, Karama's voice rumbled in Naruto's mind as the youth discreetly experimented with the only aspect of the energy he seemed capable of managing at the moment with Aura as he used shape manipulation to create a small, near-perfect sphere. I wonder how your future hunter peers and she will respond to the moment that attack is unleashed. I can only imagine. Naruto eventually stopped to look over his future peers Karama mentioned. Like a certain orange-haired girl talking circles around a boy in green, and Ruby and the blonde girl chatting idly by as his sister talked to a famous red-headed girl. He was pretty sure he observed one of her tournaments on his travels. She was pretty damn good, but really needed to work on her semblance. She used it in a subtle way, but to him, she was squandering her talent. There would come a time when she needed it the most on a large scale, but would her control be enough? Only time would tell, but Karama did state that she needed to figure things out quickly. This girl that Weiss was attempting to recruit to be on her team was none other than Piranikos. Her red hair was in a ponytail that spun down to her waist. In addition to having green eyes, she also wore light green eyeshadow. Her outfit showed off the muscles she no doubt worked hard to acquire. She wore a brown over bust corset with a vertical strip of lighter brown in the center. Additionally, Pira wore an elastic, black, A-line miniskirt and brown opera-length gloves on both arms. She wore a red ankle-length sash that wrapped around her skirt. As for accessories, there was a small circular bronze plate on her right hip opposite two pouches with both connected to a belt. The plate bore her emblem, which was a spear piercing through a red background. Underneath her hair, she wore a brown circlet adorned with a pair of small, green, teardrop-shaped emeralds on thin chains. She also sported a large bronze gorget around her neck and a bronze bracelet on the upper half of her left arm. John. Naruto called out when he noticed his friend looking lost in the locker room. Apparently, the boy forgot that he had put his stuff in the locker next to Sid's and his. Over here, remember? Oh right, John replied as he scratched the back of his head before opening his locker to put his sword and shield that acted at the sword's sheath. It was simple and did not have a gun form. Whoever was going to be on his team needed to be able to cover that slight shortcoming. We will do our part to make sure you survive the initial test, 
Even if we can't always be around, Sid started as he took out his weapon. A black cross-shaped kite shield with a white cross in the middle of the intersection. It looked simple but was also thicker in places to accommodate some surprises. Whatever team he landed on, he was the defense and long-range support. Sid had also changed out of his PJs. Now, he had on a pair of blue jeans, black running shoes, and a frosted mint green dress shirt under a black vest. Finally, his faunus feature was just a simple jaguar spotted tail that he often had wrapped around his waist so people often dismiss it as just a fancy belt, just like with his PJs. Survive? Oh boy, if I land on your team, I will be grateful. John then eyed some of the girls and had a dopey grin cross his face. I also won't mind being on a team with a beautiful girl that can also kick ass. He's going to get eaten alive, Sid deadpanned as he watched John walk off towards Weiss and Pira. We cannot let him near her. The white-haired Schnee brother just snorted. She'd eat up the poor fool. That is why I doubt they will actually let him on our team. The same could be said for my sister and me. I know she wants to be on my team. Along with that Pira girl, she is trying to recruit. There is a possibility though, Sid interjected calmly. I have read up on this school and their team making is part of the initiation test and there are four members. Beyond that, however, is as far as I got. Any information we take into battle is good, Naruto replied with a nod before wincing as John seemed to strike out twice, once being too blatantly brush off Pira for Weiss and then talking to her once Weiss denied him. It was slightly comical to see him pinned to a wall. Wow, some real lady killer vibes I'm picking up from you, Naruto deadpanned when he helped the guy up. Yeah. Having some trouble there? The blonde girl that was usually around Ruby interjected with some amusement. Now that they were up close, Naruto had to admit she was beautiful and projected an aura of confidence. Maybe she had some advice for John later on? Naruto noticed she was pretty tall like him, was fair-skinned with lilac eyes, and had long blonde hair that cut off near her, but and she was rather a him, curvy, almost to the level of another friend he knew. She wore a tan jacket that showed off her midriff, with golden brown piping and short, puffy sleeves with black cuffs that featured two gold buttons. Underneath this, she wore a low-cut yellow crop top with her emblem, which seemed to consist of a black flaming heart on the left breast. For the lower half, she wore a brown belt covered by a pleated brown piece of material reaching from hip to hip around the back of her waist, with her emblem emblazoned on the rightmost pleat in gold. Underneath this was a long, white, asymmetrical piece of material reaching to her knee on the right side as well as a pair of tight black spandex compression shorts that reach her upper thighs. She wore a pair of brown, knee-high boots and orange over-the-knee socks, with the right sock pushed down just below the knee. A gray bandana was tied around her left knee. Finally, it seemed her weapons were attached to her arms in the form of yellow bracers, which probably meant she was a close-range fighter of some sort. I thought confidence was key here, John groaned as Glinda called for all of them over the intercom. Usually it is, Naruto replied with a wince. But two things here. One, don't brush off the redhead, and then come on to her when my sister denies you. Two, my sister can be picky. You really have to show her you are worthy of her time. Is that what we are calling it now? Ruby asked with some mirth in her voice, but two was also dripping with sarcasm. The white haired teen chortled as he turned to Ruby. I'd say yes, you just need the right icebreaker. Oh, punny. Nice. The blonde girl throwing an arm around Ruby's shoulder. Stop that. Ruby protested in complaint. Thank you, said Naruto. So Ruby intros? Oh right, this is my sister, Yang. Ruby suddenly said excitedly. Oh, seems I am not the only one looking out for family here. I can respect that, Naruto replied, shaking her hand with a smile. Yang smirked. I did notice you checking us out earlier, cutie. Glad to see you were just looking out for my sister as you looked out for yours. I like that, the end words said with a sultry tone. Right? Naruto replied somewhat awkwardly. Really? We both know someone worse, said Deadpan as he walked up to them. Yeah, but I am used to her, Naruto groaned before introducing his friend. While John here already knows him, this is my best friend Sid. Pleased to meet you, Sid replied with a small smile. But we should really get going. For years, you have trained to become warriors, Ashbin stated as he stared at the group of first-year students, all in a line on the cliff above the Emerald Forest the testing grounds to see if they had what it took to be huntsmen and huntswomen. He did see the slight flinch that John had and instantly knew that he would have to watch out for that boy, despite his transcripts. His many years having deduced that in an instant, however, he also secretly smiled behind a cup of coffee when he saw the male Schnee patting him on the back. It seemed he already had people looking out for him. In the form of the infamous Ares Schnee. Interesting. Today, 
your abilities will be evaluated in the Emerald Forest. Now, I am sure many of you have heard rumors about the assignment of teams. Glinda interjected her part as she held a data pad with which to observe the students in the forest, Ashbin having his own in his non-coffee-mugged hand. Well, allow us to put an end to your confusion. Each of you will be given teammates, today. There was an air of excitement in many of the group while a few showed their nervousness to the potential teammates. Naruto exchanged an unnoticed subtle glance with Sid and two others. These teammates will be with you for the rest of your time here at Beacon, Ashbin stated as he noticed the various moods his potential students adopted. So it is in your best interest to be paired with someone with whom you can work well. That being said, the first person you make eye contact with after landing will be your partner for the next four years. This got a yelp of shock and dismay that went ignored. After you have partnered up, make your way to the northern end of the forest. You will meet opposition along the way. Do not hesitate to destroy everything in your path, or you will die. Naruto heard John gulp and patted him on the back, letting him know he was going to be okay. John had him, Sid, and oddly enough, Pira on his side. Despite John's earlier brush off of her, there seemed to be a small attraction there. Interesting. Maybe John had a chance after all. You will be monitored and graded for the duration of your initiation, but our instructors will not intervene, Ashbin continued with a slight roll of his eyes. Honestly, it was always the same with new students. They were either super nervous like with Ruby or John, had a cocky attitude like with Yang and Cardin, or were fully prepared for what was to come like the Shni twins and a few others. You will find an abandoned temple at the end of the path containing several relics. Each pair must choose one and return to the top of the cliff. You will guard that item, as well as your standing, and we will grade you appropriately. Are there any questions? Yeah, um, sir. John started to ask but was quickly cut off. Good. Ashbin continued as if he didn't hear the boy. Take your positions. John, you will be fine, Naruto stated as he patted the boy on the back as soon as various glassy platforms started launching people into the air above the forest. I wasn't expecting this. John freaked out. Someone will catch you, or you'll get impaled on your way down, Naruto shrugged. Much to his horror while a few people found some humor in that. Pira shook her head while Yang just giggled before she winked at Naruto and Ruby and put on a pair of aviators and was launched into the forest. Happy landings, Naruto cheerfully called out after he and Ruby were launched, and then John was next, him screaming the whole way. Ashbin took another sip of his coffee and just hummed. Of the various landing strategies, Naruto paid attention to a few, like the crazy orange-haired girl using her hammer as a ride, her green friend hooking himself into a tree and then spiraling down, and Pira, using her shield to crash into trees to slow her descent, and then shoot off her spear to impale John's hoodie to a tree. He was kidding about John being impaled. Well, at least he didn't have to worry about his blonde friend for the moment. Now, it was his turn to land. Noticing that Weiss was using her glyphs as springboards, Naruto decided to take a more casual approach. Putting his hands in his pockets, he created a series of glyphs of his own and casually jump-strolled down to the forest below. He made his landing into the Emerald Forest look easy, like he was taking a stroll through the park. As for Sid, he used his shield in a similar manner to Pira, only he didn't blast through them. He bounced off various trees before using the last of Naruto's glyphs to land safely. The two best friends shared eye contact and smirked at each other. Very well done, Sid, Naruto praised. Compared to some of the other things we have done, that was easy, Sid intoned with a stoic look on his face. I wonder how the other two fared. The other two that Sid mentioned descended into the Emerald Forest in a simple affair. As for who they were, they were a pair of teen girls that looked ready for anything. One such was Ebony, known to be very beautiful and had silky dark hair tied up in a long ponytail with her bangs perfectly framing her face. She had glossy lips and black eyes. She had a white shirt that barely seemed to contain her large assets and the black bolero jacket with little golden snakes lining the edge seemed to frame them perfectly. Next, she had on a pair of skin-tight black pants that are partially covered up below the knee by red with gold trim knee-high stilettos. Ebony used her weapon's axe mode to slice into a few tree branches to slow down her descent, and then the partially detached wires of her guitar mode to swing safely down to the ground before ending in a gymnastics finisher pose as the axe fully changed to the guitar mode. The weapon itself was black with it outlined in red with white strings. She turned with a smile as Gwyn made her way down easily. Gwyn's green eyes are covered by frameless glasses, red hair cut into a shoulder-length bob style to deal with the heat of the desert with her old home in the desert. She wore a pair of black sandals, white shorts that showed off the sun-kissed skin on her smooth legs that went on for miles, a black shirt that covered her modest chest, 
and a white tassel jacket that worked well with the modifications to show off the light tan wings that looked to belong to a hawk or vulture that she used to safely land next to Ebony, where the two then locked eyes with Ebony smiling wide. Are we ready to go? Gwen asked softly before they both noticed a small pack of Bio wolves coming their way. Once these dogs are taken care of, assuming that bitch doesn't have any surprises for us, then yes, Ebony replied with an energetic smile as she started strumming her guitar, generating violent sparks of lightning along the strings and sporting a slight blush on her cheeks. Then let's take care of these and be on our way, Gwen replied as she took out a white pole from her jacket and let it fully extend to a halberd with a large curved silver blade with a black edge. Gwen started slicing into the grim with practiced ease while Ebony covered her from behind, playing the Wonder Woman theme as the lightning jumped from her guitar, frying the beasts it touched, all with an exuberant smile on her face. Was this part of the forest on fire before? Naruto asked with wide eyes. No, Sid replied shortly as he brought his shield up when he noticed a large pack of Bio wolves still in the area. The moment the Grimm saw them, they instantly stilled as their red eyes glowed ominously. This seems to be an accident of sorts. It would appear others don't have their version of teamwork down yet. Understandable, given we all don't know each other. I'll take it as a good sign that there are no bodies, but this stillness freaks me out every time, like she is communicating with them, Naruto replied with an uneasy look, despite him casually twirling around the sword hilt in his hand before taking hold of the unique rifle form made of hard light dust, with said hilt acting as the main grip. The forest shook as a roar of a great beast sounded out, and the other Bio wolves cowered for a moment. They parted, submissively, as a much larger creature made its way toward the front of the pack. It was far taller than the other Bio wolves. Barely any of its fur was visible as thick, bone-like armor covered its body and ended in massive spikes. This was an Alpha Beowulf, the leader of the pack, and it looked far older than any of its kind. The intelligence in its eyes calculating ways to defeat the two boys. Sid glared at the beast behind his shield before moving it, to where the longer section was vertical revealing a gun barrel. Seems this test is one way for her to try and kill us again. Makes me wonder how long this one has been hiding in the shadows of the school. Careful, you're starting to sound excited. Naruto teased as a whirring type sound began to emit from the rifle aimed at the pack of Grimm. Please, these are nothing. Just try not to be too theatrical until Ebony gets here. I'd rather not listen to her complain, Sid replied in an almost bored tone. Heh, for now. The Shni replied with a grin before a blue beam of light blasted outward. A sonic boom sounded off, and in the next moment, a large trench was blasted through the pack of Bio wolves. The beam traveled far into the forest, sounding off for all to hear. The result was half the pack dead with their leader's right arm obliterated into nothingness. That railgun is impressive as always, Sid said nonchalantly as he started mowing down the now angry pack of Grimm with his shield's gatling gun mode. The rat tat tat covering Naruto's footsteps as he charged at the Alpha Grim with a grin on his face and the rifle returning to being a hilt, which was then aimed at a low angle. The Grim growled rabidly at the teen as it let its remaining claw crash down on the Shni, only for the boy to disappear from its sight and reappear behind it. A pale blue blade of hard light now extended. The next moment, the Grim roared out in agony as its remaining arm fell to the ground in a loud crash. Naruto grinned widely before backflipping onto a newly formed glyph and then rocketed off it to slice the big grim to pieces and finally landing behind Sid, his back to the mayhem they created. That didn't take long, Sid replied flatly as he watched the grim's bodies start to fade into nothingness. Let this be our war call, the Shni declared before both boys headed further into the forest, not knowing that something bigger had awakened. Ashbin was stunned at what he observed on his screen. There were quite a few talented students this year. However, two teams caught Oshpins, Naruto and Sid, along with Ebony and Gwen. These two teams took down their opposition with practiced ease. He had been right to keep an eye on them. However, there was a familiarity he sensed with them. He couldn't place it, and that bothered him. That was quite the attack, Glinda stated as she recovered from her own shock when she heard the sonic boom and had to search around for the source. It seems that an attack that powerful is a one-shot and needs to be quickly reloaded. It is a good thing for Naruto that Sid was there for him, or I fear Naruto would have been overwhelmed. Something tells me that wouldn't have been the case, Ashbin said lowly before switching the feed to Ruby and Weiss, his eyes taking on a soft look as he remembered teaching her mother as well. In any case, our last pair has been formed, sir, Glinda informed him. Nora Valkyrie and Lyrun. Poor boy, I can't possibly imagine those two getting along. Still, 
he is probably better off than Ms. Nikos. I don't care what his transcripts say. That John fellow is not ready for this level of combat. I guess we'll find out soon enough. At their current pace, they should reach the temple in just a few minutes, or sooner in other groups' cases. Speaking of which, what did you use as relics this year? Silence. Professor Oshpin? Hmm? My apologies, I was caught up in memories, Oshpin replied with a grunt, seeing that Ruby and Weiss weren't really getting along. Switching the feed to Naruto's group, he answered. Chess pieces. When they said temple, I was imagining something more than just the ruins of one, Naruto stated flatly, with a hint of disappointment. The few structures we passed were nothing but ruins, Sid replied, his tail unwrapping to swing to show his amusement. I expecting nothing, but it seems we are the first ones here, so we get the pick of our choice. After us, of course, Faunus Trash. A crude voice rang out as someone threw Sid to the side before walking over to one of the black chess pieces. More specifically, the Black Bishop. Animals don't belong here. Naruto was pretty sure this jackass was named Cardan. He had burnt orange hair that was combed backward with a slight peak at the front and indigo eyes. He wore silver-gray armor with gold trim. His chest plate sported a bird with its wings outstretched as his emblem. Underneath the armor, he wore a black shirt with red trimmings and black pants with a red sash tied around his waist. He also had on silver-gray armored under-the-knee boots that matched the rest of his armor. And who are you to decide that? Naruto replied tensely as he helped Sid back to his feet, who wrapped his tail back around his waist, a snarl facing the trash and animal comments. The name's Cardin Winchester. You do well to remember it since my family is a big name in Vale, and I'm sure a Shnee can have a better friend than a dirty animal. You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort, so what do you say? Cardin asked as he held out a hand for Naruto to take. I think I can tell the wrong sort for myself, and you're the textbook definition? Naruto replied with a modicum of highbrow dismissiveness as he turned his back on Cardin and went to pick up the Black Knight piece. However, it was kicked out of his hand by another boy who had actually stayed hidden. According to Cardin, he felt it prudent in case the animal attacked him. The one who had kicked the piece was another teenage boy built slenderly and slightly shorter than Cardin. His head was shaved with a light green mohawk, and he wore a hoodie with the sleeves cut off, along with two bracers on his arms extending from the wrist to just below the elbow. Those bracers had his silver-colored emblem printed on them. Beneath the hoodie, he wore a pale green, long-sleeved shirt and a brown strap around his chest holding a spiked spalder to his left shoulder. He wore dark gray pants, and his boots seemed to be made of a thick brown material and went up to his knees. Come on, Shni, you are far better than that. Are you really going to reject an offer like that? The boy sneered. Forget it, Russell, Cardin sighed as he picked up the black knight piece and held it with a smirk. Little Shni really fell far from the tree if you ask me. And I take that as a compliment, Naruto responded, his voice taking on an air of threatening composure, before dropping a pebble that ricocheted off a series of small glyphs, ending in painfully striking the hand that held the Black Knight piece. He then used another glyph to catapult the piece gracefully into an open hand, while using one glyph to block the attempt to intercept. I rarely receive so few in relation to that stain on the family name I, unfortunately, have to call a father. Cardin and Russell were about to make another attempt on the piece, but were stopped when a boulder appeared out of the sky in front of Sid. The large rock shattered in their direction, forcing them back. Once the dust settled, they saw what looked like a spike retract back into a slot that was nearly flush under a gun barrel aimed in their direction. Professor Oshbin did say we were to destroy anything and or everything that gets in our way, said Naruto conversationally, his voice not losing the edge of threatened composure. And while you two are not what he had in mind exactly, you still fall under that statement, and that boulder was only a warning. This is not over, said Cardin as he and Russell walked away. I think waiting by that cliff for Ebony and Gwyn would be fine. No doubt Gwyn would want to think up a plan to return to the cliff that Ashbin shot us from, safely. Naruto, that statement makes our headmaster sound insane, Sid admonished as they kept walking but noticed a lot of leaves had fallen from the trees in this area. Ud. So what if it's true? All the best people are a little unhinged, Naruto replied with a shrug. Hmph, true that may be. I still think that we should respect him, even if we are not his side. Yet, Sid started before he pointed at the poorly made leaf trap, snickering with Naruto as they walked around. The odd part about that hole, though, was the fact it was right near the cliff. Whoever dug this so close to the edge of the tree line, and the cliff wasn't very smart. Sid's sharp eyes also noticed movement above, 
and raised his shield just in time to defend himself and Naruto from some crudely made wooden spears that fell from the trees. I can't believe that didn't work. Cardin angrily roared as he came out from behind a large tree facing the cliff. Really? You resorted to shit traps to get us back? Sid flatly asked, unimpressed because they could quickly jump out at a moment's notice. What better way to trap a filthy animal and keep the riffraff out? Cardin replied with an uncaring shrug. Now you are going to hand me that chess piece or else? This would be ill-advised, Sid replied as calmly as he could. His temper was rising way too quickly for his liking. Cardin was really testing his nerves here. I doubt Professor Oshbin would approve. I don't give a crap what Oshbin thinks, Cardin screamed at them with a rapidly reddening face. This is a prestigious school that shouldn't degrade itself with the faunus nor their supporters. Really? demanded Naruto. You'd risk your stake at this school. Sid suppressed a groan at that pun. Just to sabotage us? Naruto took out the chess piece and dangled it in the air with a cheesy grin. That grin though was wiped off his face when from behind. A piece of wood knocked into his hand, causing the piece to fly out of his hand, then bounce off Sid's shield and fly above Cardin's head, who tried to catch it with a triumphant grin. However, it flew a little too high, and as his fingers brushed it, he fumbled around until his foot hit a root and they both dropped hard. Cardin's face paled considerably when he opened his eyes to find his top half was over the cliff, and he watched the relic fall into the darkness of the gorge below. He let out a decidedly unmanly scream as Russell quickly helped him back up. He was about to yell at his partner, but was interrupted by a fearsome roar from below. Roar. The call of a mighty beast was heard soon after as the relic must have hit something down there and angered it. The ground shook as Russell fell on his ass, and Cardin struggled to stay on his feet. Since Naruto and Sid were not near the edge, they fared a little better. As the ground shook and a violent updraft pelted the cliff, the ground began to break and crack until the piece of land the two bullies were on started to slide downward, only made worse by the hole they dug. That is when they saw the red eyes and claws of the beast as it tore its way upward. Oh crap man, help! Russell screamed in terror while Cardin tried to crabwalk up the sliding piece of land with a silent scream etched on his face. This was something they were not prepared for. Should we? Naruto asked seriously as he put on a faux-thinking face. Sid rolled his eyes. Being a pathetic school year bully in your late teens is one thing. Dying at the hands of some great and terrible grim is another, he said before stalking over to Cardin, grabbing the back of his armor and throwing him to safety. Naruto sighed and did the same with Russell. Sid smirked lightly at being the better man and brought out his Gatling gun on mode on his shield and let off a few rounds, making the creature cry out as it slipped into the abyss below. But it was far from done with that. He just had a terrible feeling about that. Naruto noticed upon turning to face the grim with Sid that the two hapless fools who had solicited their help were not within his peripheral vision. Sorry, furry lover, came the mace wielder's voice from a distance away. You and your pet are going to have to do your best without us. Naruto, if I ever run into those two after they somehow survive this forest, I'm going to kill them on sight, Sid said casually with a slight growl as he and Naruto looked at each other in an almost nonchalant fashion. That was when the Grim shook the land and soared high above them and roared. And boy, was this a big boy. The Grim had the head, wings, and talons of a large predatory bird, and the rear legs, tail, and body of a lion or tiger. Like the Alpha Beowulf, this creature showed its age as most of the fur and feathers were coated in bone-like armor and spikes all around its body, with some particularly wicked ones in the folds of its wings and the tip of its tail. On its bird-like skull, it had a bone-white beak and four red eyes, along with gray webbing on the sides of its beak. It roared angrily at them from the sky. Preaching to the choir and getting in line, Naruto replied in a similar fashion, as he tossed his sword into the air to flip off the grim and the idiots who ran off before catching it again. After I'm done stringing them to a pillory, flaying them alive, ripping out their spines, and then beating them with said spines. Beating them with their own spines? Said Sid, getting a weird look on his face, which was oddly matched by the grim that got agitated by Naruto's crass gesture. That doesn't seem physically possible. That's what that goon sent by my crooked old boar to harass me said, replied Naruto with a somewhat sadistic smirk. Once again, your father is a jackass. Sid sighed tiredly. I have known that for a while. So, what the hell is this thing? Naruto asked as he stared at the beast with boredom, much to the beast's anger. It's a griffin, a soft female voice stated. The voice belonged to Gwyn as she and Ebony casually strolled onto the scene. I clotheslined the two cowards for fun on the way here, 
Ebony cheerfully stated. We heard their parting statements, and I just had to. Also, why is there a black knight piece that is just like ours in one of its eyes? Gwyn asked seriously. Carden thought it'd be funny if we failed. Sid groaned. Of course, the one they needed was part of the beast that was angry at them. Also, thank you for the parting shot at them, Ebony. Oh, my pleasure, Ebony replied in a seductive voice as a light dusting of red coated her cheeks. I may have sent a shock to their systems too. She scares me sometimes, Sid replied lowly to Naruto. So how are we going to kill this thing? I am sure it is tired of us ignoring it. A louder roar confirmed that statement. We hit him hard and fast with style, Naruto replied with a playful grin on his face. Ebony, give us a beat. That style being theatrical. I love it. Ebony cheered before she started shredding on her guitar. Sparks beginning to fly. Put on you war paint. Naruto sang loudly as the griffin did a loop in the air and then tried to drag him down in the gorge below. Tried being the key word here because as he started to fall, he created a black glyph that stuck him to the side of the cliff and with a wave of his sword, now infused with a bit of fire dust, in the other hand, unleashed a barrage of seekers. You are a brick tied to me that's dragging me down. Strike a match and I'll burn you to the ground. We are the jack-o'-lanterns in July setting fire to the sky. Here, here comes this rising tide. So come on. Naruto laughed as he played with the creature. He stopped the fire, and when the Grim went to attack, he wasn't there anymore. Looking down, the creature squawked in shock before Naruto sprung up from a wind glyph, keeping him in place, and used a form of hand-to-hand -hand combat that came from one of his scattered memories. Rising wind or something, but the point was he kicked the Grim back up the cliff and on the ground. Put on your war paint. Crosswalks and crossed hearts and hope to dies. Silver clouds with gray linings. Ebony sang exuberantly as she started hacking at the bone armor with a not-so-nice grin before electricity burst from her axe-wielding arm. The guitar strings in that form detached from her arm and started to wrap around the grim, inducing violent arcs of lightning to course through its body. So we can take the world back from a heart attack. One maniac at a time we will take it back. You know time crawls on when you're waiting for the song to start so dance alone to the beat of your heart. The grim roared angrily in defiance as it shook off the strings and took to the skies again. It may have bitten off more than it could chew with these teens. It thought it heard its brethren fighting off more kids, so it started to fly away. It could use their help, but first, it had to dodge the shots of violent wind from the flying girl. Fascinating, Gwyn stated as she peeked out from behind the sniper rifle scope that was also her halberd. Your sense of theatrics seems to always be on point, and it is driving the creature to flee. Gwyn analyzed a bit amazed that her leader could be like this and still act like a normal person. He was an enigma to her, which was part of the reason she continued to deal with him. But I am not singing. Ditto. Sid sighed. He was adept at legitimate theater, not impromptu music videos. Ah, no biggie, just try and keep up. Naruto said before using his glyphs to summon two small nevermores for Sid and Ebony to catch a ride on while Gwyn simply took off using her wings. He simply used his glyphs to make larger jumps he was more or less walking among the birds. The chase was on. You must be joking? Glinda asked flabbergasted, watching the data pad of Naruto and his team chase after the high-level grim that had their relic in its eye, while singing and soaring through the air. My my, this year will certainly be entertaining, Ashbin responded behind a cup of coffee. However, if one were to look closely, there was slight panic in his eyes as he observed this group's teamwork. The way they moved was more like seasoned hunters and huntresses. Then there was this feeling he couldn't shake off. Like he had seen scenarios like this in the past, not to mention the high-level grim that shouldn't be in his forest. More like a year of headaches. With that ruby girl who is two years younger than everyone, that spastic Nora girl, and now this group of crazy kids. I don't know what is worse. Glinda groaned, knowing they were all going to be a handful. Of course, you would come up with this idea, Weiss replied flatly as she used a black glyph to keep ruby in the makeshift slingshot they made with Blake's weapon. They had trapped the Nevermore chasing them in a bit of Weiss's ice against a much larger cliffside. Think you can make the shot? Ruby asked as she readied her large scythe, crescent rose. Humph, can I? Weiss stated smugly, but Ruby actually questioned her in her naivety. Can yo? Of course I can. Weiss snapped before sending her partner off towards the large Nevermore. Ruby used sniper shots from her weapon to speed herself up and hook said scythe under the beast's neck then sticking to the side of the cliff thanks to Weiss's glyphs that aided the girl into slicing the head off as soon as she got to the top, like an inverted guillotine. 
Do you hear that? Yang asked Blake after staring in awe at her little sister for a moment. But what she heard was a bit distracting. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of gunfire. And singing? Blake deduced, drawing attention to her from Weiss while Ruby, up on top of the cliff, looked bewildered at what she saw. Even John's group, who were looking in awe at what Ruby and her team did, were distracted by the new arrivals. Hey young blood, doesn't it feel like our time is running out? Naruto sang out with a cheesy grin on his face as the griffin squawked in surprise to see that the nevermore it was going to recruit for help was now headless from a bunch of newbies. It had seen a lot of them as of late in this forest and had killed a few, but mostly stayed hidden until today. Her word was law. Kill the nightmares, she said. Well, these brats were nightmares all right, and probably its end. Why was the white-haired one bouncing all over the place and cracking its armor? I'm gonna change you like a remix. Then I'll raise you like a phoenix. Wearing our vintage misery. Ebony grinned wide as Sid and Gwyn distracted the beast with hails of gunfire. So as she continued her guitar riff, she used her lightning manipulation to completely disappear, herself and the summon. After a moment, she appeared to strike a deadly bolt of lightning into the beast's chest, further shattering the bony white armor. No, I think it looked a little better on me. I'm gonna change you like a remix, Naruto said as he decided to free fall below the stunned Grimm. Many thought that his aura levels were low and were running to catch him, none more so than his flabbergasted but worried twin sister. However, none of his teammates did. Gwyn always knew he had some insane plan to defeat enemies like this, so she wasn't worried, just intrigued on how he would do it this time. The white-haired male Shni smirked to himself as he landed on another glyph directly below the griffin, and braced as the barrel of his weapon's rifle form was aimed skyward at his team's prey, his free hand pulling out a single vial of fire dust, subtly infusing it with his aura and an intended shape he had in mind. Only Naruto, glad to have you back, Weiss said wistfully to herself as she watched her brother's showboating. He could give Ruby a run for her money, who really just thought the whole thing she was seeing was awesome. Nora, in all her chaotic nature, had to agree, and as for a certain blonde, she was really just impressed with it, just as she had been with her sister. With his hair covering his eyes, he sang the last verse. Then I'll raise you like a phoenix. The railgun sounded after he threw the vial between himself and the griffin, destroying the glass of the vial and mixing the unleashed dust into the trail of the rail shot. The ancient grim was torn through by the railgun blast before it was engulfed in roaring flames, effectively burning it both inside and out. The scene from all around looked like Naruto had created a phoenix out of the now, burnt to a crisp griffin grim. Russell Thrush, Cardin Winchester, Dove Bronzewing, Skylark, Professor Oshbin called out to an auditorium full of students. He was announcing the teams that had passed, but he would keep an eye on this one because he knew they were going to cause issues with their negative worldviews on the faunus. The four of you retrieve the Black Bishop pieces. From this day forward, you will work together as Team CDNL, led by Cardin Winchester. The boy just looked stoic at the announcement, but Ashbin hoped that by putting Cardin in charge, he would grow to be a better person. Up next, a ragtag group of teens walked up to the stage, and he was curious about how their time here would help them. Jonarc, Lyrene, Piranikos, Nora Valkyrie. The four of you retrieve the White Rook pieces. From this day forward, you will work together as Team JNPR, led by John Ark. Ashbin gained a small grin at the shock the blonde boy produced on his face. John may not have much experience fighting, so forcing him into the role of leadership could prove to help the boy in his career. He had seen it before in a few other students, and it usually worked. Congratulations, young man, he stated with a small grin, especially when Pira gave him a good-natured punch to the arm, which knocked him over. Blake Belladonna, Ruby Rose, Waishini, Yang Xiaolong. Ashbin called as the four girls came to the stage and he was getting a bit more excited here, mostly because he had a soft spot for Ruby, thanks to her parents' team. He did feel bad. After all, they all lost Summer Rose. The four of you retrieve the White Knight pieces. From this day forward, you will work together as Team RWBY, led by Ruby Rose. Once again, he saw the shock on their faces that they would be led by someone so young, especially Ms. Schnee. He had his reasons, selfish as they may be. And finally, Aries Schnee, Sid Evergreen, Ebony Ward, Gwyn Lakis, Ashbin said as he called on the last group, and this was just as interesting to him as Ruby's team. He did feel a strange connection, but he still could not remember why. Still, the group theme felt right. Plus, he saw as the room quieted down as he gave them Naruto's birth name. Two Schnees in one school, with the male having been thought dead. Oh yes, very attention-grabbing. The four of you retrieved the Black Knight pieces. 
From this day forward, you will work together as team ages, led by Ari Schnee. He did notice that they didn't seem surprised by this information, but still were happy nonetheless. The strange teamwork led by Ares was certainly unique. Looks like, this will be an interesting year, Ashpin said whimsically. After all, all four of these teams were unique in their own ways. Cardin's being stiff and rigid with old world views. John's being unfocused, but with high potential. Ruby's playing to his nostalgia. And Ares playing to his curiosity and their strange musical number of a fight just to get their relic piece. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support, and look forward to seeing you in our next video.